Go Inside the Crimson Tide with your hosts Rodney Orr and Gary Harris, keeping you informed on everything Alabama. Tider Insider TV, brought to you by Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports. Look at me, I'm setting up the, the drinks today because it's a brand new day on Tider Insider. Good evening, everybody. Welcome in to TITV, brought to you tonight by Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports. Don Staley, the CEO and president, and all his great uh, staff do incredible work, Rodney, uh, helping Tuscaloosa gain tourism and sports events, and we're just thrilled that they're part of the program. Absolutely. And glad to have them on board. We'll be talking more about them uh, on Tider Insider TV again. Welcoming Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports as our sponsor here on TITV. I'm Gary Harris, joined by Rodney Orr from TiderInsider.com. Let's get to it. Well, last month, one of the, the big stories was Texas A&M coach Jimbo Fisher on the uh, rubber chicken circuit. You know what that is, the speaking mm -hmm. engagement circuit. He was at the uh, quarterback club there in Texas. And, hey, this stuff happens. But he, he said the Aggies will beat Alabama's you-know-what while Nick Saban's the head coach. Well, we don't know if that's going to happen, but he's going to get plenty of opportunities, yeah, it looks like, Rodney. University of Alabama Director of Athletics Greg Byrne announced on Monday that the head football coach of the Crimson Tide, Nick Saban, and the university have agreed to a contract extension. The new agreement will extend his current contract by three seasons to eight years and keep him in charge of the Crimson Tide football program through at least February 28, 2029, when he'll be 77. Saban turns 70 this year on Halloween, so he remains large and in charge. Earlier this year, Alabama celebrated its sixth national championship of the Saban era, and it just keeps on rolling. And now it's time for Coach Talk. We were able to catch up with Coach Saban last week in Birmingham at his Knicks Kids golf tournament. It was before he signed his contract extension, but to hear him talk about getting back to the parts of the job that he loves, interacting with players and staff around the football facility, it's easy to pick up on just how much he enjoys being a head football coach. But the face-to-face -face contact, getting to meet people and sit there and look at them eye to eye with their parents as well as the prospects or, you know, something that I've always really enjoyed. Uh, I think developing relationships with all the people in the organization who are going to impact, you know, a guy's future, whether it's people in academics, strength and conditioning, medical staff, nutritionists. I mean, to develop relationships with all those people is something that uh, I think is very important. And Coach got plenty of face-to-face -face opportunities this past weekend. The NCAA on June 1st cleared official on-campus visits. And football hosted a bunch of recruits over the weekend. More on that uh, as Rodney will break down Alabama's latest commit coming up a little bit later. But let's discuss, Rodney, this, this contract extension. Now, listen, you and I have been saying for some time this guy is, is 69 going on 39. Hmm. And he is showing no signs of slowing down. Still, when you're going to turn 70 later in the year, you know – that rival schools, those coaches are selling recruits on, listen, you sign with Alabama, there's no guarantee that Nick Saban's going to be your coach in a few years. I think this kind of was a big, you know, you know what, that's kind of a message to all these other schools and coaches yeah, that I he's going to be around. Absolutely. I think it's a strong message, and I think it's one, as you look around the SEC, Gary, they've taken notice already, even around the country. Uh, you know, I've seen some responses from Oklahoma, Ohio State, various places about this contract extension. Hey, look, they know they're chasing Nick Saban, and it's going to be a, a longer race than they expected. Yeah, and, you know, I've had some people on my radio show and call me here at the TV station saying, well, just because he signed a contract extension doesn't mean he's going to coach that long. And it doesn't. There are never any guarantees. But I don't see any reason that he won't mm -hmm. <laughs> based on what he's built here. And, and you and I have said this. I think I said this to you a few years ago when people – nobody's still talking about it much. He's got a chance to get to 300 wins mm -hmm. in his career. And, and I think that he never talks about those types of things. But along with all the national championships, 300 is kind of a magic number. If he stays the length of this contract, he's going to get there and then some. Yeah. He is. And, and, you know, recruiting purposes. Yeah. I think it's really important when you talk about some of the young coaches that they have around him now in the SEC. You're talking about Kirby Smart. You mentioned Jimbo Fisher. Uh, you know, Dan Mullen down at Florida. Various places. You look around the conference. He's, he's facing a lot of youth on that recruiting trail. And I think this kind of sends a message once again to these uh, recruits, prospects, their families that Nick Saban plans to be here for a while. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of sending a message, Alabama softball has uh, sent one that they're one of the top programs in the country. Now, their season ended last night earlier than we would have liked as they lost in the elimination game to Florida State in the
the final four, eight to five. The Seminoles scored all the runs in the first three innings. Alabama rallied and, and made a game out of it, but they just couldn't come overcome an eight nothing deficit. But for Alabama, a um, little disappointment after winning the first two over. Arizona and UCLA, a perfect game by Montana Fouts against UCLA. They were in the runner's bracket. They don't make it. And certainly for these seniors that are going to be leaving, it's a time of sadness. But for SEC Player of the Year, Bailey Hemphill, uh, she was understandably emotional after the game when she talked about what this school and this softball program means to her. All I can say is I'm heartbroken. Um, wearing this A has meant everything to me. This university has given me more than I ever could ask for, and I can't help but get emotional. I mean, I don't care about the wins and the losses. I mean, I came out of here as a better person, so I am just forever grateful. That's what it's all about. And, and granted, fans pull for the team to win, and, and, and we do keep up with the wins and losses. But inside the program, she gave us a little glimpse into it's about a lot more than that, isn't it, Rod? Well, you don't have the kind of success Patrick Murphy's had without having, uh, you know, the kind of chemistry uh, you know, the things that really build relationships. Nick Saban talks about relationships. I mean, they have strong relationships within this program. That is what has sustained mm -hmm. his success, been one of the keys. And uh, we see this all the time. I mean, Bailey Hemphill is another example, but we've seen players come through here. Uh, Gary, how many players still kind of hang around the program? That tells you a lot. Well, I like football. Absolutely. Let me ask you this. Uh, they beat Arizona and UCLA. Those teams have combined for more national championships than every other school in the country combined. Uh, they beat Arizona, and then the next night they beat UCLA, the first time they'd ever beaten UCLA, with a perfect game by Montana Fouts. No excuses. I mean, it was their job to come out and, and, and be ready to play against Florida State on Sunday. Uh, but do you wonder almost, this was such a big win and such a huge celebration that maybe – not per, on purpose, but maybe they lost focus a little bit. Well, listen, uh, I, I, I'll be honest with you. It, I, it's more than wonder to me because watching that celebration Friday night, uh, it was a little concerning to me. Not the celebration. You understand that they're going to be emotional. But at the same time, hey, look, you still got to close Job's this thing down. out. I yeah. mean, you got a long way to go. Uh, to win this championship. And again, you understand the reason for the celebration. There's no question about that. But yeah, I, I thought, man, this may be difficult to overcome. And it, it was more difficult to overcome than I expected. Yeah, it was the per first perfect game in the Women's College World Series since 2000, 21 years. All right, Alabama's postseason run in baseball, a good one. The fact that they had a postseason run. Right. We hadn't talked about that in a <laughs> That's while. That's good. Uh, they got the Hoover for the SEC tournament, then they qualified for the NCAA. Ruston Regional hosted by Louisiana Tech. They were the three seed, and uh, they lost to North Carolina State, the two seed, the team that went on to win the regional. Then they did beat Ryder 3-1 to one, as Dylan Smith tossed a uh, complete game, and then they lost to Louisiana Tech in an elimination game. And listen, I, I think they went down there with the idea that they could have a chance to win this thing. But uh, still, to get into the postseason, uh, Coach Bo said it was a step in the right direction, and the future's bright for the Crimson Tide. When you're playing a really, really good team or a regional host, your, your margin for error is slim, and you, typically only one team gets to win their last game uh, if you're in the postseason. So I hated to, to finish on this note, but really proud of our group of older kids and, and proud of this team. All right, Ryan, you have to keep it in perspective. Uh, the goal for the women's softball team was to win the national championship, and they came up a little bit short. For this team, though, just to get to the postseason, again, not satisfied but as Coach Bo said, it's a step in the right direction. Well, we, we've said it all along. We, we said it the last several weeks of the regular season. If they can get to the postseason, that's a step in the right direction. So he kind of confirmed that uh, himself. And, again, I, I think now is where do you go from here? Yeah. And, and I think they've got to bring in some more players. Well, it looks obviously. like they may be doing it without T.J. Reeves. You know, this portal isn't just about football. A couple years ago, kid out of Hueytown, outfielder, was a strong player for the Tide. I thought he was going to be a star. Injuries limited in this season, and uh, he has reportedly entered his name in the transfer portal. He still has two years of college eligibility remaining. I like T.J. Reeves. I'm hoping maybe Alabama can keep him, but it looks like he may be looking to move on. Well, still to come on Tider Insider Television, Julio Jones gets traded to a new team, and it could have serious impact on which NFL team Tide fans root for. We'll explain. And Alabama's loaded running back room is going to get even more crowded next year. The beat goes on for Alabama in recruiting. We'll have the latest. Plus, we'll be getting your phone calls, emails, and tweets. The phone number, as always, 205-348-WVUA. That's 348-9882. There's the email address, or you can tweet at us as well using the hashtag TITV. We'll be right back with the only show that takes you inside the Crimson Tide, Tider Insider TV.
And welcome back to Tider Insider Television, brought to you by Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports. Alongside Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. This past weekend, Alabama football hosted some of the top prospects in both the class of 2022 and 2023. And Alabama, um, as you might expect, with that many top players on campus, did get a commitment. Four-star running back Le'Veon Moss out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That's right, LSU country. Uh, the Tigers wanted him bad, but at least for now, he's committed to Alabama. Six feet, 195 pounds. Physically, he is uh, really put together. Uh, nearly 1,400 yards and 16 touchdowns last season. He's the Tide's second running back commit for 2022, along with Geneva County's five-star Emmanuel Henderson. Rodney, uh, Alabama has kind of become running back you. Now you've got two top running backs in this 2022 class coming up. Tell us a little more about Le'Veon Moss. Well, I actually talked to one of my really good sources down there in Louisiana who's, who's uh, been around him for quite a while. He compares him to T.J. Yeldon. He says he's T.J. Yeldon 2.0. Uh, you remember the great back sure. here. Look at him. Physical runner. He has speed. Uh, you know, he has all the tools, Gary. Obviously, Alabama wouldn't have recruited him if he didn't. Came down to Alabama and LSU. Uh, again, like you said, LSU will continue to recruit him. We'll see how that goes. But but, uh, you know, the feeling is that Le'Veon is pretty solid to Alabama. You know, uh, with running backs coming in the way they are, as crowded as that running back room is, uh, there's always a chance that players are going to leave. We know Keelan Robinson announced a couple weeks ago that uh, he was in the portal. He has since announced he's going to Texas. And now Kyle Edwards, who was on the Alabama roster, another Louisiana running back, uh, has reportedly gone into the uh, portal as well. Uh, only thing I can figure, because he's, he's a talented guy. Like you said, he wouldn't be here if he wasn't, but with – Jason McClellan, Roydell Williams, Trey Sanders, when he comes back, obviously Brian Robinson. Um, it's a crowded running back room. Plus, you're going to add Kamar Wheaton already here this summer. I guess he just felt like that uh, it was time to look somewhere else because of all the competition. Well, again, like you said, there's only so many balls that can go around, only one, actually. So it uh, makes it difficult to get these backs their touches. But you know, Nick Saban in Alabama has done, a, as you know, Gary, a great job in terms of using three, sometimes even four backs, use them in different ways, have a rotation uh, when you don't have that bell cow necessarily. So a lot of these guys are going to get their touches, but I, I would think that perhaps, you know, Kyle said, hey, look, you know, Alabama's got two basically what amounts to five-star backs coming in. Emmanuel Henderson and Le'Veon uh, Levy Moss are two of the top three yeah. backs in the country. Yeah. <laughs> you know, think about that. Edwards, six feet, 215 pounds from Destrehan, Louisiana, committed to Alabama and signed with the Tide in 2020 over Michigan and Notre Dame. So he'll have plenty of offers in the portal. I promise you that. Let's get to the NFL. Julio Jones arrived in Nashville on Monday after the Tennessee Titans traded with the Atlanta Falcons for the dynamic wide receiver out of Alabama. He was greeted on the tarmac by Titans general manager John Robinson. Tennessee acquired Jones and a sixth-round pick in 2023 while sending Atlanta a second-round pick in 2022 and a fourth-rounder in 2023. Julio brings the Titans a second big-time threat at the wide receiver position along with A.J. Brown, who, interestingly enough, grew up idolizing Julio Jones. And he offered Julio his number 11 that he wears in honor of Julio. Julio said, nope, that's your number. Julio, I guess maybe we'll wear eight, which yeah. is what he wore at Wouldn't Alabama. We shall see. But uh, my gosh, Rodney, just a quick thought on Julio joining Derrick Henry, A.J. Brown. I mean, you talk about Ryan Tannehill's got a rebirth there at Tennessee. This offense, suddenly you stack the box like people like to do against Henry. Julio's just going to go yeah. to the top on you. You know, you mentioned A.J. Brown. Came out of Starkville High mm -hmm. School. I remember calling his high school coach. He said, look, he's Julio Jones part two. <laughs> And I think he's going to Alabama. Well, of course, he ended up at Ole Miss. But, yeah, he's a tremendous You know player. what's interesting? He went to Ole Miss. He gave his all. He's still kind of an Alabama fan. Yeah. <laughs> you, he wanted to come here, I'm telling you. Interestingly enough. All right, still to come on Tider Insider Tio, former Crimson Tide golfer, has a memorable debut on a pro tour. We'll explain. And next, we'll be welcoming your phone calls, emails, and tweets. Again, 205 348 WVUA. That's 348 9882. Go ahead and call now. We'd love to hear from you. We'll be back right after this. You want to talk about a pro debut? Former Alabama women's golfer Kenzie Wright won her first professional tournament, Rodney. First one ever. Wow. The Women's Texas Open and took home 78 grand. Mm. How about that? Wright posted a pair of the best rounds of her career to open the tournament strong. Back-to-back -back six under par 66s on Wednesday and Thursday in Garland, Texas. And the Alabama alum carried a three-shot lead in the 55-person final round Friday morning before recording, recording a one over par 73 to complete her scorecard and pick up the victory. Congratulations to her. Welcome back into TITV, presented by Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports. Alongside Rodney Orr, I'm Gary Harris. And uh, ESPN is reporting, this is ESPN, that Julio is going to wear number two 
with the Titans. I thought it would be eight, but you made a good point during the break. Two could be one, one for 11. Mm -hmm. It's going to be long and lean in that number two, <laughs> though, I can tell you that. All right, uh, time to take some phone calls, get to some emails. What we got, guys? We got an email. All right, this is from Dale in Moundville. And, uh, oh, he is on the phone. Okay, I'm sorry. All right, Dale, down in Moundville. We got you, pal. Go ahead. Hey, guys. Hey, Thanks Dale. Take my call. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say Alabama fans and Coach Murphy, I know, is really going to miss the, uh, Bailey Hentpeel. She's Absolutely. one of the greatest players I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. What a heart of a champion. But uh, I know we have uh, Will Anderson and uh, – Chris Allen as starters on the uh, outside linebacker position, but I'd like to hear y'all talk about the backups. And one of them I was really surprised with was the uh, Chris Braswell. I thought he really stood out in the spring game, had three sacks. And the fourth one I, that I think will be the outside linebacker will beat everybody out. I think he's going to be hard to push aside. Is going to be Dallas Turner when he comes in. And I, I'm sure he's already on campus, but – his, his videos are amazing. I just wonder if this could be maybe the best outside line, linebacker group that uh, Coach Saban's ever had. All right, Dale. Thank you, and, and we'll get to that. And you had me already thinking about best outside linebacker groups ever. Duo-wise now, in 85 and 86, they had Cornelius Bennett on one side and Derek Thomas on the other. It'd be hard, <laughs> it'd be hard to beat that as a, as a two-player uh, duo there. But I think Dale's got a point. When you're looking at, at talent, depth, uh, experience this outside line record group that Alabama is going to put on the field in 2021. It may be Saban's well, best. South Sincerity has quite a group. Yeah. I tell you what. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Will Anderson. Uh, obviously, Chris Allen, uh, Drew Sanders, outstanding player. Um, we didn't mention he, he didn't. One he didn't mention Gary that I think has got a lot of talent too. It's just opportunity to see the field is going to be King Makuta. Uh, he's an outstanding player. Of course, obviously, you mentioned Chris Braswell. So, as far as Dallas Turner's concerned, uh, yeah, there's no question. He's a five-star talent out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The question to me about Dallas Turner is, ultimately, does he end up kind Dallas of more of a defensive dirt, yeah. end? I mean, you look at him physically. He's a guy that can really, I think, get bigger. Uh, but that's not taking anything away from him, certainly his potential as an outside linebacker. Not saying that at all, Dale, but uh, I could see him having the versatility to also go down. All right, let's get to an email real quick if we can. Rodney, this is from Dallas in Oxford. Rodney, do you expect Alabama football to receive several commitments this month? Well, Dallas have already gotten the one, the running back, uh, uh, Le'Veon Moss. Have we talked about more to come? Well, I mean, I think it's very possible, yeah. We've put some guys on alert in terms of, you know, for our subscribers. We've mentioned several prospects that we thought uh, maybe – could pull the trigger very soon. Uh, but you know what? Here's the thing, Gary. You've got so many prospects coming in this month. I mean, let's look at it. Well, they've got eight camps, eight one-day camps. They've got an offensive line, defensive line camp. They've got a kicking camp. So all of these things happening this month, it, the commitments may not necessarily fall this month, but I would expect after they have an opportunity to evaluate everything they saw in June at their camps, having prospects on campus, uh, you could see more start to come. All right, more TITV to come, too, right after this. There's going to be quite an Alabama influence at the U.S. Open in a couple of weeks at Torrey Pines in San Diego. Already Justin Thomas is in. How about... Davis Shore taking medalist honors at his qualifier. And then there's Wilson Furr. That was in Atlanta for, for Davis Shore. Wilson Furr in Hilton Head, South Carolina. He earns a spot in the U.S. Open field. And at the qualifier in Springfield, Ohio, it was Robbie Shelton earning a spot. So Shel Shore, Furr, and Shelton joined Justin Thomas. It sounds like a law firm uh, who was already exempt. The U.S. Open begins a week from Thursday, June 17th. And welcome back into TITV. Let's jump back out on the phone lines, and our good pal BT is with us. Hey, BT. Hi, Garrett Bodney. How are y'all doing? Doing great. Okay, good, good. I want to talk real what you were saying earlier, Gary, about the softball team. Uh, I thought it was a fantastic year. And, uh, you know, we just didn't uh, get that potential to get that uh, what we needed to be, but we played hard. That's Absolutely, the Bill. They played hard. They played with, with great uh, passion. And, and one of the last four standing, Rod, again, you know, the goal was to win the national championship, particularly once you're in the winner's bracket there. But give Florida State credit. They came back and won two in a row against Alabama. But, yeah, you're one of the final four. You win 50-something games. You win an SEC tournament championship. You win a regional, super regional. Yeah, it's a heck of a year. Yeah, and the SEC. Hey, 
And listen, they overcame a lot this season. I mean, they had several injuries. Some people think that, t what, two of the top three offensive players they had, uh, you know, were out. Uh, so, uh, again, they overcame a lot to have a very successful season, BT. All right, let's get to an email real quick. Uh, and this is from uh, Joey in Gardendale. Do you, think guy, do you guys think Paul Tyson will transfer? Why, Joey? I mean, no. I, I don't even understand where that question comes from. He's the number two quarterback behind Bryce Young. Um, I just know it knows the answer. Yeah, no, I, look, I think he's developed really well. I mean, when you look at him in the A-Day game, that was our only opportunity to see him, obviously. And uh, I, I thought, wow, Paul Tyson's really made a tremendous amount of progress over the last two years. Um, so if he continues to develop, you never know. I mean, listen, we've talked about this constantly. The backup quarterback may be the most important backup on the team because – you know, you lose that first guy, you better have somebody ready to step in. Absolutely. Well, thanks for the phone calls and emails. Still to come, former Alabama receiver Josh Lanier finally gets his signing day experience. About six years later than many do. We'll have the details for you coming up next. Last week, Josh Lanier, former Alabama football player, Tuscaloosa Academy football player, UNA football player, going to play his final year for Neon Dion at Jackson State. That'll be a lot of fun over there playing for Deion Sanders. That is for sure. Well, that is going to do it for tonight's program. It's been brought to you by Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports. Again, want to thank uh, Don Staley, Bill Buchanan, Kelsey Rush, Jasmine Rainey, all the good folks over there at Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa Tourism and Sports for their sponsorship of TITV. Don't forget, if you missed any of tonight's show, you can catch a replay tonight at 1030 after the news. We're going to leave you tonight with some sights and scenes from Alabama softball returning to the Rhodes House this afternoon. They were greeted by a couple hundred fans. Have a great night, everybody. Roll Tide.